Hey, welcome back to The Vault. Let's talk about the Macintosh. When it first came out, what do you think some of the issues with it were? Yeah, I mean, it had several, but lack of expansion was definitely one of them. But Apple had a plan to fix that while still maintaining the compact all-in-one form factor. Enter the Macintosh SE. The Macintosh SE was introduced March 2nd, 1987, along with the Macintosh 2. And the SE stood for System Expansion. It was the first compact Macintosh to feature an expansion slot, and it was internal. It was also the first compact Macintosh to introduce a bunch of other features, but we'll get to those very soon. So Steve Jobs was very strict about end-to-end -end control when the original Mac came out. Heck, you even needed a T15 screwdriver to open up the darn thing. I mean, yeah, you still need that to open up this thing, but at least this thing has expansion slots. The original Mac had none of that. But in 1987, Steve Jobs wasn't at Apple, so did the engineers have a little extra freedom? Possibly, it's something to think about. But for now, let's dive in and take a look at this guy. The Mac SE followed Apple's Snow White design language. It had a 3D Apple logo on the front, it had the horizontal stripes, a platinum colored case with very minimal surface texturing, the whole nine yards. Below the Apple logo was the brightness knob, and the speaker was also on the front positioned toward the user so you could hear it a bit better. And on top was a carrying handle, another thing Apple really liked to put on their computers. The screen was 512 by 342, one bit black and white, and it was nine inches measured diagonally. It's just perfect, the size is just perfect. The module looks tiny, but it's pretty usable actually because it's so um, crisp and sharp. So the system expansion capability was nice with the internal expansion slot, but that was just one of the new features. This was also the first Mac to feature an internal hard disk option. You can configure it with either two floppy disk drives, or you could have one of the drives be swapped out with a hard disk in either 20 or 40 megabyte capacities. Now, my particular SD has a 500 meg hard drive in it, because I can. When it comes to the expansion slot, there were several options for cards you could install, such as an accelerator card. You would use a T15 screwdriver to open the case, or Apple would likely recommend you bring it in to get serviced. You take the case off, take the board, put it on the slot, put the case back on, and you're good to go. Steve Jobs did not like noisy computers. He was very adamant on not having a fan in his products. But again, the SE came out when he wasn't at the company, so the engineers threw a fan in this guy. And that helped a lot because it was rated for up to 15 years of life expectancy now that the power supply had a cooling system. And since there was also a hard drive in here, a fan was mandatory because otherwise this thing would just get way too warm. And a fun thing is when testing these prototypes, there would be clear cases on the computers and people would put smoke in them to test how the airflow works. And again, it was rated up to 15 years. And as you can see, mine still works just fine. And it's way older than 15 years. The motherboard for this Mac was also redesigned. And a big efficiency change was with video circuitry. A custom gate array was used. And what that allowed the computer to do was continuously redraw graphics on the display while sending that data to the video circuitry way quicker, which means less of the RAM had to be used. So with this new efficient change, about a quarter of the RAM had to be used to help control the video as opposed to half. In terms of I.O., this computer had two Apple desktop bus ports. This is actually the first time they appeared on a Mac. They were previously on the Apple II GS. It had two serial ports, audio out, DB25 SCSI, and DB19 for floppy drive. The processor was an 8 megahertz Motorola 68000, and you could have two floppy drives on the front, which were 800K drives. Again, you could swap one of them out for a hard disk. And later in 1989, you can get a 1.44 megabyte floppy disk drive. You could also configure the computer with up to four megabytes of RAM. This particular computer has one megabyte, and it shipped with the two 800K drives, but I swapped one of the drives out with a hard disk. Overall, pretty cool little computer. Now, Apple sold quite a few of them, so I'm not the only one in the world to own one. So I have other collectors that want to show you some cool stuff, including a rare prototype of the SE, which was built with a clear case. So as I was searching vintage Apple product collectors, I just could not pass up this opportunity. This is Hap, and he has a prototype Apple collection. 
an amazing prototype Apple collection. So I headed out to California to meet up with him in person. But since I was in the valley, I figured, why not make a few stops along the way? Let's get on with it. The Mac has been my daily driver since I was in eighth grade. I believe my first Apple was an iBook G4. I, I had previously used uh, a Macintosh TV when it was around in the early 90s, but uh, we took it to an Apple retail repair place and they had it for six weeks and couldn't figure out what was wrong with it. And it turned out that somebody had just flipped the power switch on the back. And my parents got so fed up with the fact that that's all that was wrong with it and it had been there for six weeks that we moved to PC. I believe I had a compact for a while. So it took a while to get them back on the Mac Apple train. And eventually my friend had a G4 Cube, thought it was the coolest computer ever. And so, but they were too expensive for me to be able to afford. So after a year or so of kind of bugging them, they gave my sister and I power, or excuse me, iBook G4s for Christmas. My prototype collection probably has at least 250 pieces in it. 2006 Mac Mini prototype. This one's really cool because it obviously has the built-in iPod dock. Lisa 2 prototype, probably was a Lisa 1. Actually, I can pretty much guarantee you it was a Lisa 1 at one point in its life. Super, super early 20th anniversary Macintosh. Very, very rare. Only a couple of these, I guess, are supposedly known to exist without John Scully's signature. This is a Japanese. LPGA PowerBook, often called the Lego PowerBook for obvious reasons. This is my Walt, 1993. You know, your typical donut seller trade type drug in there. Pretty rudimentary hacked together uh, PowerBook. 100 dual G4 PowerBook, 1.5 gigahertz here. I haven't counted in a while, but I also have a lot of stuff that are boards, uh, pieces, things like that, that I have in the closet where I keep all of the other stuff that I just have and hold. So, I mean, if you counted all of that stuff, probably 400 pieces or so. What got me interested in collecting as far as what I really do nowadays was I had graduated college. I still, as I do, do to this day, have an affinity for G4 cubes. They were relatively inexpensive at that point in time. The G4 cubes, part of the reason why they were discontinued was they only had essentially a two point mounting system on the acrylic case. And when you would tip the computer to work on it on its side, that would put a lot of pressure and torque on those screws and so they were susceptible to cracking and so finding one with a really nice clean case because the acrylic is pretty soft that wasn't cracked you could maybe spend three four hundred bucks so i started upgrading them the sonnet chips and giga I forget what the name of the company was giga something were readily available fairly cheap and so i started upgrading them putting solid state drives maxing out their rams Towards the end of it, I got to the point where I was putting in um, Mac minis inside of them because they pretty much are direct fit in there and was making money doing that. Nothing crazy, but enough to pay the bills and, and enjoy what I was doing. So this is kind of where I have most of my iPhones, iOS type stuff. What product would be the rarest? It's, it's actually two of them. Um, they're the Acorn iPhones, the all black original iPhones, plastic screens, raw bezels running two versions of internal operating system ones the kind of operating system that we saw today which you point on you click on something and it takes you somewhere like letters pop up and numbers where applicable or icons whereas the other one was essentially an augmented ipod scroll interface that you could kind of use the uh, a digital scroll wheel to get to different applications and things like that which I posted a video of a little over a year ago, but those I would have to say would, would be the tip of the iceberg. Uh, nanos and minis down there. We've got my first Macintosh SE prototype. I would have to say the favorite product in my collection is, is my Mac SE, kind of like 
with anybody's first car, first whatever. It was it was my first one that that I owned. And as much as I love G4 cubes and iPhones and things like that, because it was my first in the story and how I got it, I would have to say that that one would be my favorite of all. I've had people offer me lots of money. I've had a couple of them at this point that I've either sold or trade traded, but uh, I wouldn't let that specific one go. I was perusing Craigslist one day um, and I found a gentleman that had listed a clear Macintosh SE on Craigslist. Didn't have any photos or anything about it. So I started doing some research on him and found a gentleman that had sold one and had a bunch of posters made for him. And I started talking with him and he had done a lot of research on the subject and they were extremely rare and extremely valuable. And the gentleman wasn't asking an incredible amount of money for it. Again, I was just out of college, didn't have a whole lot of money, but I did have a lot of gadgets and stuff lying around the house. So I think I ended up trading him. There was some cash involved. And then I traded him an iPad, maybe a first gen at the time, give or take. And then an upgraded G4 Cube, which at that point was essentially you know free for me. And I think the iPad somebody had given me because I they said it was broken and I just replaced the battery. So it was more or less free too. I bought it from him. He was a really nice gentleman. He was from somewhere in the North Bay. He had worked at an inner school city after school program for trying to help inner city kids get access to computers because at the time in you know the early 80s, that wasn't something that was, that was uh, afforded to a lot of those kids. So he and his buddy had developed this after school program to allow kids that wouldn't have access to computers to be able to use them after school and in an attempt to try to bridge the gap between them and their counterparts that were afforded the opportunities to use computers. And that ended up you know, going on for a couple years. And then, you know, as things happened, life went on and the business partner of his gave him a computer in a black carry case and said, here, thank you. This is for all your work. And I believe he said his buddy worked at Apple as well. And he didn't think anything of it. He just, you know, figured it was just a takeaway and he put it in his garage and he was moving for whatever reason. And he pulled it out and he said he almost threw it away. He just figured it was a basically a useless, you know, useless by most people's definition of the word beige, Mac and he probably said he had still had 30 or 40 of them but for whatever reason he decided to open it up and he had never even known he said he barely even said thank you because he just thought it was like well thanks man like you know you know I have a bunch of these in my garage and he, he so he called his friend back and kind of apologized for being an ass for lack of better words because he, he had never really opened it to see and almost was going to throw it away and and so they kind of had a laugh about that but yeah he he basically had just sat on it for 30 years basically and, and and didn't even know what it was. So a lot of prototypes, especially when they were made of plastic, started clear for a couple different reasons. One on machines that had it was what I've been told is for smoke testing. So they would basically pump smoke in through the machine and then watch the air circulation to see if they needed to either relocate or add a vent or you know move some some components somewhere to make sure that there was adequate cooling. Uh, if you don't know this, Steve Jobs was not a fan at all of basically having any fans and any computers, but it just when you have that type of power going through a machine, you know, much like your car, you need for it to be cooled. Otherwise, it's going to malfunction. So he was very form over function in that regard. But when they did have fans, it was to make sure that it was going to get adequate cooling, that it was getting ventilation to where it needed it. And a lot of times that it was also to just check clearances and tolerances to make sure that all the components were all sitting correctly, nothing was touching where it shouldn't be, so that they could kind of kill two birds with one stone. And then eventually they would go and, and use the beige plastic on the same injection molds that they would then turn into the machines that you typically see today. That was basically the start of, of my prototype collection. That was my first one. I was curious like, about what other types of devices. Obviously, there's been hundreds, if not thousands, of products released by Apple at this point in time. Found a gentleman up in Oregon that has a very large collection of prototypes. Kind of started talking to him about his stuff, how he had gotten it. Um, and just started to open to my eyes because it, from every product that you've seen come to fruition and that we use on a daily basis, there has been multiple, multiple iterations of that product. 
uh, in order to get to the place where we have it in our hands today. And, and oftentimes, they are they're small little nuances that exist with the prototypes that are different than what we see today. Some of them good, some of them bad. And, and then there's the other products that literally have never made their way to the market, that they are so prototype that outside of knowing that you either worked on that team or inside the company or incidentally having that product, nobody knows that they really existed. Hi, I'm Jan Beta, and I run this little YouTube channel where I do restorations, repairs with vintage computers primarily. And uh, yeah, I never expected this to happen, but I have quite a collection of old computers now, uh, doing this for two years. So amongst other things, I have this beautiful Macintosh SE that I'm going to talk about today. I am going to primarily talk about the SE30, though, which I did quite some repairs on to get it working. So this is my collection of classic Macintoshes, uh, starting with the Mac Plus, the next model, the Macintosh SE. This is actually the one that has a hard disk in it. This is the Macintosh SE30, which was the follow-up to the SE and had a uh, faster processor and stuff like that. I obtained these from a co-worker's father, actually. Um, the co-worker showed his father a video I made a while back about a ZX Spectrum repair that I did, and the ZX Spectrum was the first computer the father owned, and he liked my style uh, and my uh, kind of work that I did with the Spectrum. So he remembered he had these sitting in the basement and uh, yeah, never really using them anymore. Uh, it was pretty hard for him to let go of these, but he decided to let them go to my place where they could have a nice uh, new home and get some use and some necessary repairs. These two work. The Macintosh Plus still needs some special care. Doesn't really work yet. But I'm going to fix that soon, I guess. So this is the machine I did the most work on as of yet. Uh, I had to because uh, I had random crashes on startup. Uh, sometimes the screen would be uh, completely dark. Sometimes I would get a zebra stripe pattern, horizontal stripes on the screen, which is also known as a Simasi Mac uh, symptom. So all these symptoms are because of the little um, electrolytic SMD surface mount uh, capacitors that are on these main boards. Uh, these computers are from an era where the surface mount electrolytics were not very good in general and uh, most of them after some decades start leaking and uh, at least they start deteriorating in some way or the other. So. It is recommended to um, replace all those capacitors on these boards. And what I found on this board is that um, most of the electrolytics had leaked, so I could see some corrosion around that. I had to clean the board thoroughly with um, some white vinegar and some distilled water and some alcohol, and I replaced all the capacitors. Uh, there was one trace that broke while I was uh, replacing the capacitors because the um, surface was so corroded that I couldn't save it so I had to run a little botch wire which is a pretty common fix for these because um, basically the um, electrolyte that's in the capacitors corrodes the traces on the board and I got lucky because it was only that one trace and it has been working ever since fingers crossed it remains in this state uh, Otherwise, I know what to look for, like um, broken connections on the board. This is a common failure of these, so it is recommended to, to do the same on your board and have a look, at least, at the capacitors. Another common thing to look for in these, and this goes also for the Macintosh SE without the 30, uh, they have a battery on the motherboard that probably is leaking after all those years. You can just remove it. Um, in this case, this is soldered to the board, so you have to clip the leads. 
Um, they are dangerous in that they can start leaking and also corrode the traces on the board. They are needed for um, storing some settings like the internal clock settings and um, some other stuff. But these machines will work without a battery or you can just get a replacement battery. They are um, commonly available still. So I recommend uh, at least having a look at the board and removing the battery. Did that on this one as well like on all my classic Macs and as I said there is still some restoration work to do on all my Macs <laughs> so that's something I am planning on doing this year. I primarily use the SE30 which you can see here because it's just more powerful plus it can read um, HD floppy disks and like I really like the version of Pirates that is on here which is just uh, the black and white version of Pirates, which is really cool. What I primarily want to use this for is like um, text editing, which the, the little monitor is just perfect for. I love the little, the little form factor that it has a handle on top here. Uh, the form factor of the Classic Max is just, it's so gorgeous. If you've never seen one in person, um, you won't believe how gorgeous these things are. So there you have it. The Macintosh SE. Tweaked form factor, new features, expansion capabilities. Overall, an awesome little computer. And those things help take the Macintosh to the next level. If you have an SE, I'd like to know your own stories behind it, or any other vintage Apple product for that matter. Feel free to drop me a line down below because I am a curious cat when it comes to Apple stuff. And if there's any other suggestions for Apple products you want to see on the show in the future, let me know down below. But for now, that's all I have for you today. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the not too distant future.